This is in Surah Baqarah, and this is what really determines why we fast. This is Allah's order to us, and Allah says the meaning of His words, or to the best of my ability and understanding, O you who believe, Ya ayyuha ladina amanu, kutiba alaykum siyam. Fasting is prescribed or written for you. Kama kutiba ala ladina min kablikum, just as it was written to those before you. So this tells us fasting is nothing new, uh, nothing new to the dispensation of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but that uh, before the followers of Isa alayhi salam, you can see from the time of Lent and things like that, and also uh, the, in the time of Musa and alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam, that the uh, children of Israel, Bani Israel, they also fast. The fasting has been something that Allah has prescribed to Muslims from the very beginning. It's not something new, uh, just at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he wants to tell us that. Then he tells us the most important thing, la'alakum tattakun. Why do we fast? La'alakum tattakun. What's the meaning? Why, why do we fast? You fast that you may learn taqwa. Taqwa is the purpose of fasting is to learn taqwa. What the meaning of taqwa, taqwa is mistranslated usually, and uh, I've discussed this before here, as fear of Allah. Now, this is khawf of Allah. Khawf of Allah is different than taqwa. Taqwa means to be aware of Allah, to be conscious of Allah, or to be aware, to, to beware of Allah, I mean, in, in that sense also, you know. so. All of these have the meaning of it. This is what Allah is trying to be to be aware of Allah. You know, why, why have I written fasting for you? So that you might be aware of Allah, that you might know that Allah is. So that is why we fast, that is knowing that this is not something new, that it's just us people, Muslim people in this times, you know, since the time of the Prophet wasallam. but for the longest of times, all of the prophets have come, peace be upon them all, with this message of fasting from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we fast in the month of Ramadan, which means, I'm not going more into that, means this is the, 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 in, in the old days when, when the calendar of the Arabs was intercalated, which means that it was a solar calendar. Ramadan came just about this time of the year, August, around August, and it, was, it means scorching, very hot. Uh, this is the, the meaning of this word Ramadan, is something that's very hot, it's scorching, burning. So, this month is, uh, uh, as we are told by our, our elders, it's the month of Sabr. 
the month of patience. And it is also the month of charitable sharing. And that's most clearly seen in the Iftar um, daily. And always we encourage uh, people, Muslim people, to have Iftar together, if possible. Uh, at least have Iftar with your family. Sit and share Iftar together. All of you come together and make Iftar together. But better even than that is to use the masjid and come together in the masjid and make <coughs> Iftar uh, with one another and share food and drink with one another. So it's a month both of this patience and it is a month of charity. And that charity extends, we call these tables of which we eat the Ma'id uh, the Rahma, the tables of mercy. And many, in many Muslim countries, it's a custom uh, at the time of iftar for a number of families maybe will get together and they will cook all cook food and they will spread this maida, this table tablecloth, right out on the sidewalk in the street. And anybody who comes is welcome to eat. And then by extension, it is the month that we try to give in charity uh, to, uh, to those who have less than us. And this is the month of, of patience and the month of charity. Uh, it's divided conveniently into three parts. The first part of Ramadan is Rahma or mercy. The second part is Dua or seeking forgiveness. And the third part is the deliverance from the fire. So these are the three different constituent parts of it. And we, we know uh, from uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that whoever fasts, whoever fasts, will inshallah walk through the eighth gate. To the, the garden has eight gates to it. And of course the widest gate to the garden is, is humility. It's wide, but it's very low. You have to be able to get down to get through that gate. But the gate of fasting is the eighth gate, and it's called Arayan. And that's the name of it. And Arayan uh, means to have your thirst quenched. It's like when you've been fasting all day long, and you uh, make your dua, and then you break your fast, and you drink your water. This is called quenching. This is called in Arabic rayan. And this eighth gate in the, in the, to the Jannah is called the gate of the quenched. The gate of those people whose thirst has finally been taken away from them. Because in fact and in truth, all of our life we are thirsting for something. And Ramadan just helps us to see these kinds of things. Because every day we're drinking water. Every day we're eating food, but it doesn't mean so much to us because that's what we're doing every day. But when iftar comes at night and that water comes and that day comes, you really relish it. This is called the quenching. And a Muslim, in, in saying Muslim, there's a hadith from Sahal ibn Sa'ad that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is a door in the garden called rayan, or quenching. And those who fast will enter it on Yom Kiyamah. And none except those people will enter into that gate. Now people may enter, as I say, the gate of humility, the gate of this, the gate. But the people who fast, the people who fast will enter through that gate, and they alone will enter through that gate. And when the last of those people has gone in that gate, the Prophet ﷺ continued to say that it will be locked and nobody else will enter behind them. That is not said, this is not said about any of the commanded or forbidden acts of worship except for the fast. This is purely reserved for fasting. We'll go into this more. So by quenching or by this by rayan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made clear that those who fast obtain an attribute of perfection in their actions since they are described by that which has no light. And we'll go into that too, also more. Fasting has, there's nothing like fasting. The Prophet said, there's nothing like fasting. Not like anything else. 
So in reality, the one who has no like is perfect. You see? There's nothing like you, you're perfect. So the fasters among the Arafin or the Arafin Billah, the people who know by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, enter through that and they will enter it with knowledge of all of the creatures. So we also say that during this month we're obliged to cultivate four things. Two of these things earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and two of these things you cannot afford to be without. The first two things which will earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the dhikr of the shahada. La ilaha illallah. Call Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Men call la ilaha illallah. Dhakala jannah. Men call la ilaha illallah. Dhakala jannah. Who says la ilaha illallah will enter the paradise. So this is the first, the first thing that will earn you the pleasure of Allah. And the second is Rabbi Igfirli, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. These two things earn for you the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's two things also you cannot be without. And the third of those things, of these four things, is Allahumma unjurni min an Allahumma prevent me from entering the fire. Asking Allah and taking refuge with Allah so that you should not enter into the fire. And the fourth thing is imploring to be granted the paradise. Rabbi al-Khinni Jannati Mela O Allah, enter me into the Jannah, into the garden, Ma Abrar, with your pure worshippers, with your with your with your your people in that way. In this month, a good thing to know that even your sleep is an act of ibadah and it is a silent worship silent tasbih a silent subhanallah and if our silent tasbih and our silent dua are answered by Allah what then of our audible and consciously thought of dua to be answered by Allah, are not only answered, but as he said, in this month your good deeds are multiplied. So that the good deed that you do in this month is multiplied for you. And so far as to say that every sajda, for instance, we know from the hadith, every sajda in Ramadan has the rewards of 1,700 times of what it is in any other month. In every nafal, is the equal of 70 fard. So if you pray one sunnah salat, it equals 70 fard salat in the rest of the year, for instance. And Allah asks in this month, does anyone have a request to make so that I may grant that request? Is there anybody who wishes to make istighfar so that I may forgive them and relent towards them? Is there anyone who seeks my forgiveness that I may forgive them? This is, this is this month. In this month, the garden of the Jannah is totally refurbished. Every Ramadan. And it is said that the, the maidens of paradise, those with the eyes like luminous eggs, adorn themselves in beauty and are seeking for a suitable suitor. And it is said that no servant who keeps the fast at least one day in the month of Ramadan can not possibly fail to be married to a wife from the brides of paradise. So many, many blessings descend upon the mu'mins in this month, alhamdulillah. Whoever provides iftar for someone will be forgiven all of their sins and earn freedom from the fire and also will be granted the rewards of actions of the one fasting. So if you feed somebody, not only are you forgiven, not only are you given the garden, but you will also get the thawab of the person to whom you gave the thing. That's why when we all meet together in the mustard or someplace like that to have iftar together, 
you offer me water, I offer you a date, this goes back and forth like that. Everybody benefits. Everybody benefits. So at least do it in your family. So if you give it to your wife and your wife gives to you, both of you benefit twice by the, not only the fasting that you've done, but by giving to one another. And by joining together in the masjid at that time, you see that these rewards are spread throughout the entire community. The Prophet said to him, the people you know, the people came when they first came to Medina, they were very, very poor because they had to leave everything behind. And somebody came and said to the Rasulullah I can't afford to give iftar. I can't afford it. He says, even if you give a dry date, even if you give a glass of water, you will be rewarded for it. So you see that the ability to receive awards in this month is, is immeasurable. But when we think of all of these things, there's certain truth in all of this that we haven't really spoken about. We've spoken about the more outer forms of it, what, what you're getting out of it. And we haven't talked about what you don't get out of it, because there's something you don't get out of it. It has like a positive effect, what you do get out of it, and a negative effect, what you don't get out of it. And what do we mean by that? You know, in China there's a saying that you can't have a wheel without a hub. You've got to be something for the wheel to lock into, to turn around. Now what can you say about that hub? What you can say about the hub is that it's empty. There's nothing in it, right? But the thing isn't going to roll without that hub. You have the wheel as something, but the hub is nothing. And this is what I mean. There's something you can talk about that you can see, oh, you get rewards for this, you get this for that, you're going to get a wife from the Jannah, mashallah, you're going to get this, you're going to get that, this is going to happen to you because you do this, you give people food, you get that, you get the rewards of this, if you make, you make sajda, you get 1,700 tawabs for that, if you make one nafu, you get 70 rewards for that, all these things, that's the wheel, that's what you get, that's the stuff. But all of that is because at the center of it, there's something that's nothing. This take it, you have to think about this, brothers and sisters, carefully. At the center of fasting is nothing. Nothing at all. That's what fasting is about, nothing. Emptiness. Of course, the fasting during this month has many, many... Uh, what should we say, social and external benefits that, you know, that we've mentioned. But in, 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 in the case, in many cases, the, the khatibs and the people who talk about it, that's all you hear about it, is that external thing. But what we want to try to touch upon towards the end of this khutbah is the nothingness of Ramadan. Of course, charity is important. We're not trying to say that it's not important. That's not what we're trying to say. All of these things, now we're not trying to say, try to dissuade you from getting all these things that Allah has promised you all these things. Allah is going to give you all these things. Allah is going to give you the garden. Allah is going to give you a special door to go through to the garden. But again, what I'm trying to say is that all of these things center around nothing. Around the wheel that centers around the hub of it in the hub of it, there's nothing in it. Just like your belly at the end of the fasting, there's nothing in it. It's empty. Now, the most difficult part of the fast, in many respects, is not, not putting things in, and these things, not eating, not drinking, not smoking, etc. These things that, that we talk about. But it is the struggle with yourself. I urge you all, if you can get a chance to, you can find it online, you can find it in bookstores, read the book of Al-Ghazali called The Mysteries of Fasting. Because he says, and, and we know also from, from the Hadith, like, you can break your fast with your eyes. It's not a matter of putting something in your mouth. 
If you look at someone or something in the wrong way, you break your fast. Prophet Sallallahu used to talk about the people who made reba, you know, they talked about somebody, they said something bad about somebody, and the person who listened to it. So this person is not something that going into his mouth, something coming out of his mouth, breaking this fast. The person who is listening, also breaking their fast, something going into their ear. So when you read the Prophet told the people, said, many people, all they get from fasting is hunger. That's all they get, they get hungry. But how do you get more out of it? So you have to get more out of it to understand that there are many, many, many levels to the fasting. Not just not doing something, not putting something in, but also not putting things out is also part of it. And all of this, again, is the wheel around which it turns. So we speak again about the fasting of the eyes. We speak about the fasting of the ears, the fasting of the tongue, the fasting of the hands. What did you put your hand to that you shouldn't have put your hand? Where did your feet take you you shouldn't have gone to? All of these things, which has nothing to do with eating or drinking or anything like that, are also ways in which the fast is broken. And what one has to be careful with. This is the struggle with oneself in this month. This is the meaning you have to know what you're doing in order to take the benefits from this fasting. And as a result of this, as a result of this struggle that you go through, in other words, to, to be sure that what you see is pure, that nothing comes out of your mouth except that it's pure, that nothing goes into you. If somebody starts talking about somebody, just get up and walk away. Because otherwise you lose your fast. But this is a struggle, a dynamic struggle inside of you. Not only the thing of not putting things inside of you, but not putting things outside of you. Or letting things come into you in that way. So this creates a, 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 a real struggle or jihad, which is he said, the jihad al-akbar, the struggle, the inner struggle with yourself in this month to, to purify yourself. And the one who fasts like this with a complete faith becomes aware that they are destined in truth for a world that is beyond the world that we see, beyond the sensory world. And in this way, because after a while, when I remember when, before I became a Muslim, I thought I could never do this because how am I going to fast? And how am I going to do this thing? You know, it's a very difficult thing. But after a while, and now this is the 41st or 42nd year of fasting, you realize that these things are not really all that important. You used to think that they were really important. Like, how are you going to live? But I remember when my kids would go to school and the teacher would send notes home saying, are you trying to kill your child? What do you mean, kill my child? Well, they're not eating. Well, they're not going to die. You know? But this is the way the mind, the mind of the people works. You don't eat, you're going to die. Right? So these things, this food, these things, all these things, very, very important in the beginning. But as, as you become a faster, and as you fasted over the years, you realize these things are not all that important. And so what begins to develop inside of you is the reality of another world. Understanding that there is a world beyond stuff. That you, that, that, that you live, that you actually are alive without stuff. That you don't need the stuff to stay alive. That what you need actually, that that, that emptiness that you get from the fasting is something that you cannot put a value to. It's like that hub of the wheel. It not, has a value to it. There's no value to it. There's nothing in it. But that emptiness becomes a positive value for you because you see that there's a life beyond the life of consumption, beyond the life of stuff, beyond the life of things, beyond the life of food, beyond the life of sensory uh, you know, uh, input. There is another life. 
And as that understanding begins to grow inside of you, you begin to live, as it were, in a more spiritual, in the sense of the word spirit, meaning air, which is empty. There's no, you can't see the air, or light. You can't see the light. You begin to begin to live a life, a spiritual life, beyond stuff, beyond matter, beyond food, and beyond things. And this is a divine gift of Allah. This is called ni'mah of Allah. And this thing also has another aspect to it, which is that when you do break your fast, and that glass of water comes, suddenly it's transformed. And that date, that simple date, that brown shriveled up thing, is transformed. And it becomes something far more than you could have ever imagined. And that's why we say, when we take that drink of water, the veins are suffused. Because that water enters the entire body in a way that you've drunk water before thousands of times. But nothing like at the end of the day when you're drinking it at iftar. So a simple thing, the most simple thing, one of the most apparent of Allah's many rahmas is water. Water is for everybody. Like Allah's rahmah is for everybody. Everybody drinks. Rich and poor, old and young, man and woman. Everybody drinks. East, west, north, south. Doesn't matter. Everybody drinks. But not everybody knows what they drink. Because it's just water. Everybody knows what water is. But then when that glass of water comes at the end of the day, suddenly it's been transformed. It turns into something else. The date, which is just a product of a tree that grows on the tree, becomes something else. And all of this comes from nothing. And the Sai, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, related that Abu Umana said, radiallahu ta'ala said, I once went to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and I said, give me something that I can take from you. And he said to me, fast. There's nothing like it. Listen to what he says. Fast. There's nothing like it. What he was saying here is that there's nothing like fasting. This is what I mean by the positive, the negative. There's nothing like fasting. What does Allah say about Himself? He's not like anything. Fast, there's nothing like it. It's not something, it's nothing, because there's nothing that's like it. That's what's like it, nothing. So in fasting, when we fast like this, we're reminded that Allah that we have actually chosen Allah above the world. Allah says to do this, Allah, Allah ordered us to do this, we do this, we choose you Allah in spite of the natural thing which is to eat. Everybody eats. To not eat for a month? That's not natural. Why do we not eat for a month? Because Allah told us. Why did Allah tell us? To give us taqwa. What is taqwa? To be aware of Allah. And what does Allah say of Himself? He's not like anything else. And then He goes to the Prophet, He says, Give me something. Salallahu alayhi wa sallam, something. He says, Fast. There's nothing like it. All of the other ibadah are for ourselves. We don't pray for Allah. What does Allah need our prayer for? Allah doesn't need our prayer. Allah does not need our zakat. Allah is Malik al muk How are we going to make Allah richer? By giving zakat? All this for ourselves. But fasting, hajj, we make hajj for ourselves. Fasting, he says, is mine. Fasting belongs to Allah. But Allah, who came mithli Hushayun. Allah is not like anything else. So fasting is not like anything else, meaning it's the door into the hub of that wheel, it's the door into that emptiness. 
That's what we don't need. We don't need to become empty. Because becoming not empty, we become nothing. This is called, the Prophet ﷺ said about it, Al-Fakru, Fakri. Poverty is my glory. Having nothing is my glory. Fakri, meaning to be poor, but also meaning to have nothing. To have nothing is my glory. And you have to think deeply about this. It's easy to think about 1,700 of this, and 700 of the 70 of this, and this, and one of this, and two of that, and three of this. This is about nothing. About the necessity for nothing, which is central to the whole act of fasting. And this gives us a kind of spiritual strength, because we know that we don't need anything. It's like the man says, he comes to him, I'm going to kill you. He says, are you going to kill me? He says, I'm going to kill you. Kill me. Go ahead, kill me. What do you mean, kill me? He said, kill me. He said, do you think the fish is afraid of going back in the water? Is the fish afraid of going to throw me back in the water? Okay. But how does this dawn? Because we're taught life. Hold on to it by everything that you've got. This is it. This is it. You've got to get it. Stuff of it. We said, fish go back to the water. What does that mean? How are you going to kill the fish? The fish is going to go swim in the water. You going to kill me? Okay, kill me. Where are you going to put me? Back where I am. Where am I? In nothing. Where was I before I was here? And where will I be after I'm here? This is what, these are the questions that Ramadan evokes in the people. And so this bestows upon people a great spiritual strength because you can't scare them. You can't scare people. It's harder to scare people when they've gotten on with nothing, when they've gotten used to nothing. It's hard to scare them. Like the man said, kill me. Okay, kill me. I'm just going back to where I came from. I'm not going someplace. Where's, where else is there to go? Where was I before I was here? Like I said, where will I be after I'm gone? Do you know? Where will you be after you're gone, people? Where were you before you got here? Why are you worried? About what? So these things, this is the other side, the negative side, the empty side of the fasting. Yes, there's all these positive things to it, but there's a negative, there's an empty side of it. And both of these things come together in one whole, inshallah. So this holy month is called Mubarak, or Blessed. And it is the month in which the grace or the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flows in the Islamic community and rejuvenates the deepest sources of our life and action. And we all pray, inshallah, that we may all get to know these things, get to understand the positive blessings of it and the negative blessings of it, so that we may have the whole of it and understand who we are, where we're coming from, and where we're going, inshallah. I'm going to sit down now between the two khutbahs. Ask Allah to forgive me my faults. You ask Allah to forgive you your faults. Everybody here makes mistakes. <laughs> Prophet Allah said, Go to Allah with your mistakes as numerous as the foam on the waves of the ocean and you will still find forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu al rahim Istighfar is looking backwards. The stick far is what you did in the past. What I did in the past. I did this thing. Astaghfirullah. I'm sorry Allah for that. But there's a past, there's a present, which is where we are, and there's a future. What's the future? Tawbah to Allah. So when you make your stick far in the past, for what you've done in the past, make Tawbah to Allah that you won't do it in the future. Take this time, inshallah, brothers and sisters, to ask Allah for forgiveness and make tawbah, inshallah.
Alhamdulillah. I always remind you, Imam Al Ghazali said about the istighfar, don't take a long time making istighfar. Going over your sins only strengthens them. You know what you did wrong, I know what I've done wrong. Ask Allah for forgiveness. Make